Okay, let's keep going here. So uh, question number two is due on due Friday at noon, and test number one is Tuesday. We'll discuss test number one shortly. Are there any questions? Yes. Project question yes. on one F when we are calculating the different variances. Okay, it's been two hours since I saw that, so I gotta find the thing again. Um, where you said you wanted to compare the different um, for uh, the linear approximations with the LJs, LJAX, and L hat mm -hmm. J. Um, for the LJ, do you want us to use the formula version like we did in 1A, or can we use the nth, nth version of it, which are going to be close but not necessarily? They might not be exactly exactly the same with my Okay. So I don't care. Okay, I just didn't know if you wanted yep. to see a particular one, so it would be easier to grade. I or... think it'd probably be um, um, perhaps a little bit quicker. Well, next, I don't think it's going to matter because you're not simulating that much data. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, I just thought we'd check because I know some of us did it one way and some of us did it another, so we were comparing. We're like, oh, we're close. We must be all right. Along <laughs> well, the same lines, you say you don't want plots, but do you want to see what code we ran to? Um, yeah, I would like to see what code you ran to, to make your evaluation, yes. Okay. You can include plots if you really, really want to. I have five more pages of stuff just for plots. I don't think you want all of it. <laughs> and so, you know, you don't have to feel guilty either about including plots because you're not going to be killing trees because it's all electronic like a tree is. It's true. But you have to scroll through it all. <laughs> I remember with the days that I used to not do stuff um, turn in electronic, which was about 10 years ago, and I'm going to have students stacks of papers. Fortunately, I don't do that anymore. Thank you. Any other questions? First of all, just uh, two very small notes. It's not necessarily related to our, not necessarily exactly with respect to our class. First of all, do any of you ever watch the show Backyard Farm? My parents do. <laughs> Anybody heard of Backyard Farmer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you know that they are actually t um, doing a live broadcast in Harden Hall at 7 o'clock tonight? So if you're looking for something to do after class, you know, go to Valentino's, get dinner, then come at 7 p.m. down to the auditorium and you can be part awesome. of the okay. audience. Is it a special year for them? Yeah. It's their like 60th anniversary. What is it? Well, first of all, it's um, uh, 60 years they've had the same show, and supposedly it's the, like, the longest-run TV show in the history of TV. And basically it's a show on gardening and other stuff like that. Um, and it's a show every, every <clears throat> I guess, uh, pretty much May through now, um, uh, every night, or oh, every Thursday, 7 to 8 p.m. on uh, NET. Channel 12. And people can call in with their gardening questions and stuff like that. <laughs> I must have been probably about 20 years ago. I thought I would probably think that old people watch that show. Mm -hmm. I'm watching that. You're watching it. <laughs> it was in Minden one year. What's that? It was in the town I went to high school in, Minden. Okay. Somebody won their backyard redo. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of cool to go and see that. Because wow. they got a brand new backyard. That's nice. That must have been before I was watching it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, usually about once or twice a year they, they do on-location stuff. And, and the cool thing about this show is that uh, they have basically professors who are on the show. And often, well, many of these professors actually reside in this building. So, um, I don't know. I've never interacted with any of the particular professors, professors but I've seen them on campus. Um, and actually uh, doing um, some of our step faculty actually do consulting. So anyway, so, so that TV show is on, on being taped, so if you look for something to do after class, please feel free to do that. I wish I, I could go, but I can't. Um, and I would have loved to take my three and a half year old son with me because he loves Backyard Farmer. When the show comes on, he says, Backyard Farmer! And um, uh, in particular, there's um, a 
a little garden that they have on East Campus. It's um, uh, just east of Kine Hall. Um, and, you know, they'll usually do segments on the show from, um, tape segments on the show from that garden, see how things are going. And what's kind of cool that you can actually go on campus and see the actual garden. My son loves to go there. Probably because he also gets to go to the dairy store and get ice cream too. But I think it's because of both ice cream and the garden. So that was just one little quick note. Here's another little quick note then. Um, have any of you heard of MOOCs before? Did any of you listen to, what's that? Is it a restaurant? Or no. no. <laughs> There's an ice cream place called Mook. Well, that's not the Mook I was, I was thinking of. Did any of you listen or, or even attend Harvey Perlman's uh, Stanley University address a few weeks ago? He talked about Mooks. Okay. Well, Mooks are... Um, oops. Is that Massive open online courses. One of the revolutions that's happening in teaching right now is, you know, it's like stuff that we're doing right here where I can record what I'm doing and anybody around the world can actually watch my videos, download my lecture notes. They can pretty much basically do everything that you guys are doing except for I'm not going to grade their homework, I'm not going to grade their tests. But they can do that. And in fact, there's a few few people who do do that usually every semester with my courses, uh, at least once a few people tell me that they do that. And so I guess I have a, a small version of a massive open online course. Uh, but a few years ago, people at MIT and a few other universities uh, started doing these where they just basically said, okay, any course that we teach is going to be recorded and anybody can watch the recordings and get all the notes and everything. Um, it was a nice you know, from, from the standpoint of being an educator, I think it's a really, really nice thing. And, and these are becoming more and more popular. And there's even companies out there, for example, one called Coursera, uh, sort of by some people at, from Stanford a few years ago, or actually within the last year or so, um, that I don't know how they make money, but it's a company that they're trying to make money, but they allow universities, to, as uh, they provide universities a way to scrub it to distribute their moots. Um, and in Harvey Perlman's State of the University Address, he's actually formed a committee to look more into moots. It was an accident at some point. Anyway, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of statistics moots out there. But there was one that recently came across on Twitter today that I noticed. So this is just my, my Twitter feed, if you want to see that. David Smith, who works with um, who works at Revolution Analytics, um, uh, he tweets this, and I have no reason to doubt him. 40,000 people have enrolled in Course Era's R Stats course. So think about that, and, and the popularity of how R has it's just extremely grown. That there's this course that's uh, basically computing for make that a little small, computing for data analysis, and talking about how to use R. Supposedly 40,000 people have signed up for it for free to learn about how to do that. And given how much we use R here, and the fact that I am in the minority of people who use R amongst the faculty in my department, I thought I'd bring that up to show you that indeed R is very, very uh, important. Okay, any questions? Okay, well let's get to the main real reason why you're here. <laughs> And that is, uh, we can talk about the tests. So let's talk about the tests. And then I'll throw it open for questions. So test number one. I don't know if any of you, you know, happen to explore my course website uh, before I updated for um, this semester. But previously, the way I had done the course uh, was I um, had a midterm and a final not have like a test one, test two, and final like what we are. Uh, the reason why I, 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 I made the switch is because I removed one big component of the course um, for, for this time that I'm teaching. The big component was um, all students had to give a, a, a presentation on a, um, like a statistical research paper that used the bootstrap. And that usually took about two days of class. Well, usually I had smaller classes than I do this semester. This semester we have, I think, 
11 students in total. Um, and given that these presentations, for them to really be worthwhile, they need to be 25, 30 minutes. So you can see how many that might take up quite a few, few course periods. So that's why I decided to remove these presentations um, uh, from my usual way that I teach this course this semester. And instead, I added a test um, to kind of replace the, the presentation part of the grade. This is background there. So uh, with the tests, I will be having virtual office hours in the corresponding chat room for our course from 4 to 5 p.m. on Monday. So if you have any last minute questions, please feel free to stop by the virtual office hours. Uh, I will actually be in my office too, so you can always stop by that way. Uh, normally I usually have these virtual office hours in the evenings, but I happen to be also given a test in my other course on Tuesday, and so I had to pick one course for the evening, and one course, I guess, um, for, I guess, the regular work day for the virtual office hours, and I decided to make this one our course for 5 p.m. Uh, however, you know, if you do have last-minute questions when you're studying, you know, that on Monday night, you know, please feel free to post them to the list. I guess you could show up in my stat 870 chat room and ask the question and you can really scare some of the students <laughs> if you ask them. <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, so, the test will start obviously at 4 p.m., uh, but I will go until 5.25 p.m. if you need the extra 10 minutes. I write the test for an hour and 15 minute class, but if you need time, we can go a little bit longer. Test covers chapters one through two, except for the double bootstrap of chapter two. Uh, the chapter one stuff's just kind of just the big picture stuff, you know. Uh, I mean, you'll see what I mean by that when we do a review. And this is the structure of the test. Uh, there are actually five problems. Problem number one, 12 points. And there are three parts. And it has something to do with R. <laughs> you want more specifics? <laughs> what is R? <laughs> <laughs> Involves R and the bootstrap. How about that? <laughs> I don't think it's going to be a difficult <coughs> Hopefully it will be a good way to start the test. Number two, 31 points. Five parts, and it also involves R. In particular, for this problem, you are going to have to write a function similar to what we've done in class and in the projects, a calc.t-like function that calculates your statistic, and you're going to have to actually use the boot function. Number three, 16 points, two parts. And you are going to need to derive an influence function. And do some other stuff with it. But that's the main part there. I'm going to give you some kind of parameter of interest and you're going to need to derive an influence function corresponding to it. Number four, it's worth 21 points. Three parts, and it's a question regarding the parametric bootstrap. Number five is 20 points with three parts. And these are short answer that are not necessarily connected in any way. Take many of my tests 
another class, it's the usual kinds of questions that I put at the very end of the test. But what do I mean, though, for those of you who have not taken one of my classes in the past? Uh, basically, these are just uh, questions where you might have to write at most maybe a paragraph to answer it. Um, it these questions, in case I didn't say, they're not necessarily connected in any way. So part A has nothing to do with part B and so on. And these are questions that really help me focus in on a certain aspect of some stuff that we are doing and to make sure that you understand what's going on. Here's a question from a previous exam. This is actually, I would say, an easy question. What is the difference between the non-parametric and parametric bootstraps? Okay. How would you respond? Here's what was on the answer. The parametric bootstrap finds the parameter estimates for f, so the parametric distribution, and then plugs them into f to form f hats. Resamples are then taken directly from this parametric distribution. The non-parametric bootstrap does not make this does not make any assumptions about f. Instead, it finds the EDF and calls this f hat. Resamples are taken from f hat by simply sampling with replacement from y1 through y. That would be a short answer. So maybe about four sentences or so. That's what I'm talking about. And there is actually a problem number six on the test. It's two points and it's extra credit. Now note that only number one and number two involve R. I was kind of surprised after I wrote this test that only number one and number two involved R. I mean, it's about 43 points, but that's it. Please be aware that even though you, know, you have these computers in front of you, you're not necessarily going to be using the computers constantly throughout the exam. Also with the tests, there is one problem taken from the homework. So obviously, if you've been doing the homework, this problem should look familiar and should be quite easy. If you haven't been doing the homework, well, it's too bad. Hopefully you will in the next few days. So that's the structure of the test. Now remember with the test, I will hand out this formula sheet and a notation summary sheet. Please make sure you look at those before the actual exam. Uh, note that this notation summary sheet, I will only give you the chapter 2 portion of it. So it's all that we basically have done. We have done chapter 3, 4, 5, or 6. So you do not need to bring this sheet to the exam. I will actually pass it out. Okay. So but what's going to happen on Tuesday, just to remind you, um, at the beginning of class, what I would do is pass out a paper copy of the exam. This is where you need to put all your answers. You need to write your actual answers on there. What you can use are on these computers um, to help answer problems in a similar way as you would use, let's say, a calculator maybe for a math or stat class that doesn't have a computer-based exam. Now, when a problem involves or, or needs R, what do you write down then as an answer? Let's say you need to do a basic bootstrap confidence interval. Well, obviously, you should put down the actual numerical calculation. Maybe the interval is 4 to 6. But similar to what you would do if you were, let's say, just doing a, a, a test, let's say, with a calculator, you, would, you need to show your work. You need to tell me, well, how did you get this interval 4 to 6? One way you can show your work in this particular case would be to actually write out, well, what was the actual you know, uh, formula that you were using? So, you, know, you would write something like this out. You know, depending upon the actual problem, you, know, you may need to actually tell me what the certain aspects of what you're writing out are, but I need to see some kind of something that shows your work to me. And the reason why I need to see that is because let's say the actual interval was 
10 to 20. And maybe you only put down the interval 4 to 6. How am I going to know what you were what you did? Or where where you went wrong? Uh, or maybe you almost at the very end of the test, so you thought you'd take a take a wild guess and you decided to put the interval four to six at because just maybe that was right. Um, you know, if you only had this and it was wrong, well no credit. So I have no idea. I might give you one point for the fact that you knew it needed to be an interval. Uh, <laughs> I often refer to these as mercy points. Uh, but you know, give me some evidence of showing what, what you did. And I recommend, like, always showing, show me the formula. Now, if you have time, and only if you have time, maybe let's say you have completed the entire test, um, and you've got 15 minutes left, and you're looking for, what do I do? Well, what you could do is actually write out some of your code. Now, don't get extensive. But, you know, what could you do? Well, you could say, well, I use the boots. Got the CI function, put in whatever, whatever arguments you have there. Maybe you could actually write out, maybe maybe in the earlier part of the problem, you needed to write out what your calc.t was. You can write that stuff out, but this is not required. Obviously, though, that might help me to see what you did to. So I guess just to emphasize the point. Now let's say you did put uh, 4 to 6 as the interval and you also told me exactly what you were doing, and let's say that this is right, that you were supposed to do this, but maybe you just went somewhere wrong in your calculations, well, this would give you partial credit. And if you also gave me some information here, that would help me give you partial credit, even if you got that wrong. Are there any questions about that? So you'll be using the computers here. Uh, if you have not already, I recommend checking or, or actually logging on to these computers to make sure that you know what the login is. Does everyone know what the login is? I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. S-stat lab. S-stat lab. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Right. Harden Hall, stat, you're very happy. That's the way you remember to put two exclamation points. <laughs> so, you know, what's on these computers? Um, R Studio, R, and Tin. Okay? Make sure also you're familiar with, for example, how to read in data sets. Um, surprisingly, when I get tests like this, I usually have, um, more so in the introductory classes that I teach, I usually have students, they, they raise their hand, hand because they're, during the test, because they're in complete panic, because in the last 15 minutes they've been trying to read in a data set to start problem number one, and they haven't been able to read it in. So, make sure you know how to read in data into R, and even if it's not using your own computer. I will tell you it won't be an Excel file because there's various problems with 64-bit, 32-bit stuff. So if, it, if, it, if I give you a data file, it's going to be an ASCII text file or common delimit. How can you read those in? Read that table so a uh, convenient function to use. Um, also, I recommend that so that you have um, some some record of what you are doing in terms of you know writing code. Actually, at the end of your exam, save your code to like a, a flash drive or something so that you have some record of what you do, and that will help you retrace steps if something goes wrong, uh, if, if you end up missing some points on a particular problem, it allows you to figure out what you were doing wrong. Okay. So the test is, of course, closed book, closed notes, but you do have access, you can have access to 
all my R programs. Um, so what I recommend that you do if you have, and hopefully you've been rerunning all these programs on your own, but if you haven't been, you know, get familiar with these programs. Um, you know, I don't want you to have to memorize our code. Um, but I, I want to, um, I want to give you a, I don't want you to remember, have to memorize our code. And so because of that, I'm going to, you know, give you, give you my R, R programs. Because this is how you would do it outside this class. Is that you probably find some previous program that you've written, you know, because maybe you don't remember the exact syntax for, let's say, the boot function. So find a previous program, copy, paste that program's implementation boot function to your own program, and make corresponding changes. That's how people typically program. So that's why I, I give you that kind of environment where I allow you to have access to my R programs. But again, to emphasize a point, you cannot use any of my lecture notes, you cannot watch videos of me teaching uh, during the test, you cannot go to my homework web page and download the homework there, you cannot look at project answer keys. So please be aware of that. Be careful though too that you don't become over uh, reliant on these programs. Um, you know, you shouldn't be taking five or ten minutes searching through these programs to try to find one particular aspect of how to do stuff. You know, rather, you know, if I ask you to, let's say, find a find a conference interval, uh, find, find the, uh, do the studentized conference interval. Hopefully, by now, you know one place where that can be found is in this particular program. This example, 2.4, so on, dot R program. Find how I did it there in the corresponding spot. It is a long program. Um, and then use that as guidance for how to write your own code uh, to find studentized interval. So don't waste time by by over by being over reliant on these uh, programs. What is not allowed during the exams? Make sure this is clear. Well, of course you shouldn't be communicating with anyone inside our class or outside of our class. So don't be logging on to the chat room and hope and hope that everyone else in the class is also logged on and communicating that way. Don't do that. Uh, don't have my lecture notes open on your on your on your computer. I have had students do that in the past. Despite me saying don't do that. Um, keep your eyes on your own computer screen. Obviously in this kind of a setup, you know, you can look around your computer. Sorry for a you don't have to be able to do that. But in the previous in the other rows, you know, don't look around your computer to see what's on the person's computer screen in front of you. Um, I'll also don't Use a large font on your computer screen too, so that people would be easily be able to see what's uh, what's on your computer screen. So anyway, so if you do any of that kind of stuff that I was just describing to you, that I would consider that to be cheating. And remember, I can see your computer screen from up here. Okay. Any questions before we get into a review? Any questions about the structure of the test and what's going to happen on Tuesday? Um, so I know 80 degrees, 80 degrees for your pre and that would show that, you know, particularly well known, but is there anything that would be, uh, you might be helpful for you for the exam, like for the therapy or anything? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. It's something I've, I've, you know, always think about when I write a test like this. Um, And I guess I, I've had a hard time, let's say, communicating, you know, what would be, let's say, fair game for me to think that you know. I mean, again, as you said, it's a prerequisite. But, you know, I'm not going to ask you to, let's say, uh, I will not ask you to use, let's say, the transformation method to derive the distribution of, let's say, x plus y, where x is normal, y is something else. I will not ask you that. Um, what I may ask you is some stuff like you might work with the normal distribution. So hopefully you know you're familiar with well if I take three times x where x is normal, you should be able to know well what that corresponding normal is. So I would think that would be very basic. Um, 
I don't know. Do you have any other specific examples of stuff? Um, like, you know, the sum of several, like, uh, like you know, like the sum of blah, 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 those sort of things? Um, I... I will not. I will not. I hope you know what the sum of normals are. You know, often a normal distribution, you know, since we work with it so much, you have so much experience with, you know, you should know what the sum of normal normal random variables are. Uh, but once you get into other distributions, you don't work with them as much, and I would be very hesitant to do that. What I might do in a situation as you describe is actually give you that result. You're like, remember that this is this is true, so this might help you in this particular problem. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, review some material. So chapter one, I mean, it's just kind of an introductory thing just to get you an idea of what's going on here. Also give you some background stuff in terms of R. And so make sure you understand the big picture. Why are you here? Why is the bootstrap useful? And it comes down to what I described early on in, the, in those notes, which was when you do research or other stuff that you do involving a statistic, you're going to need to know that statistics distribution so that you can make inferences. And I gave you three different ways that you can come up with the distribution statistic. Start with saying why is distributed some parametric distribution and drive the distribution for t. Two, use asymptotics to get the distribution for t. Three, use the bootstrap. That's why you're here. The bootstrap gives you an access a way to do inference for, um, for a particular uh, setting. Uh, we also, this is where we define what an EDF was. Make sure you know what it is, how to find EDF, know what it's trying to do why it's a good estimate, which then drives everything else that we do for the rest of the course. And this is where we start talking about the basic, let's say, notation that we've been using in this course. We understand. And fortunately, I mean, I will give you this, you know, the notation summary sheet just as a kind of a, as a reminder, but you know, hopefully, you know, this stuff is, you know, getting to be uh, you're getting to be used to it. That is, you know, what's the difference between f, f hat, f hat star, for example? Um, and what do I mean by t of f versus t of f hat or t of f hat star? So, chapter one. Chapter two, then. The plug-in principle, that was the very first section. So that basically drives what we do with the bootstrap. You know, so much of the stuff that you had before this class, you know, says, okay, we know F. Let's do some stuff. Well, now we say, well, what happens if you don't know F exactly? Think of it in terms of a parametric or non-parametric setting. What you're interested in. Well, what can we do? Well, why don't we just do the same things that we would do if we know f, but now we use f hat instead. That's what we do with bootstrap. Now, this doesn't mean that the bootstrap then or the plug-in principle itself is perfect. And we see that, for example, how, as we've seen many times before, that you know the variance that you get is the biased version, not the unbiased version. So that shows you it's not perfect, but it's still going to get you to where you want to go you know, pretty well. Okay, so, you know, let's say that, you know, y star is then distributed f hat. Well, what we use that for then eventually is to get the distribution of, of t. I'm sorry, t star. And, you know, especially in a, 
let's say when we're dealing with the parametric bootstrap, what we can often do is then come up with a closed form expression for then what T star is. I should say closed form expression. We can come up with the exact distribution through using derivations like from 882 and 883. <coughs> But what we can also do then is actually physically take resamples from this F hat. In a parametric bootstrap setting, F hat, then basically, this is the book's notation, would be let's say F itself, but now if psi was a vector of parameters, we replace those parameters with psi hat, some kind of S. But do realize that there's you're not necessarily constrained with using one particular kind of estimate. You know, maybe you can use maximum likelihood estimates, or you could use method moments estimates too. So then with the parametric bootstrap, what you can do is there's two approaches. Just make sure that this is correct. You could derive the distribution of T star. Alternatively, you can resample from f hat, calculate t star, let's say for r equal 1 to capital R resamples, and then use these t stars that you get to be an estimate of the distribution for t star. As long as you choose r to be big, it's going to be a good estimate. Also with the parametric bootstrap, it gives me an opportunity to, to ask good questions uh, to make sure that you, you see what's going on here. So for example, I can ask you, well, what's expected value star of T star? Or equivalently express expected value star. Just want to write it both ways in terms of how the book does it. Make sure it's clear. And then you get used to the double notation. Expected value of T star given F hat. Same exact thing. So I could actually ask you to tell me what it would be. Uh, same thing for with, with respect to the, the var star of T star as well. Um, you know, you could actually derive it, or what you could do is then estimate it using the resample. So let's say an estimate of that would be 1 over r times the sum little r equal 1 to capital R of t r star. Now why is this this thing that I'm calculating through actual taking taking resamples, why will that be a good estimate of expected value star t star? I'm actually throwing that question out. No, not such a But some fear on thing that you learn at 882, 883. Law large. Law large. Specifically, we call it. That's why this works. That's why as long as you take the R large enough, that's why this is all going to work out. Make sure you're familiar with using then the boot function in the context of uh, a parametric bootstrap, even though we didn't use it a whole lot because, I don't know, generally speaking, I think it's easier to, to just simulate the samples yourself. Uh, but the boot function can be useful. Um, and remember with the boot function in this particular setting, you need to write this calc.t like function. But remember, it only has one argument, data. It does not have that argument i that we use with the non-parametric. Also, you need to have some kind of function that, um, I don't remember what, what, what we called it. Um, you need another function that, that, uh, that will generate the data. So you need two functions. A function like calc.t and then the, I think uh, our, um, our authors maybe refer to it as a simulation function. 
how are the, how is the these these resamples going to be taken from a particular distribution? And remember, there is a um, uh, argument called NLE that's in that particular function that's needed. Okay, so that takes us then to the the non-parametric bootstrap. In this setting, of course, you're taking the res you're doing the resamples from the EDF. What does that mean? Well, you're resampling with replacements. Make sure you know why we re we resample this way. It has all to do with these three letters. Now if I ask you a question like that, this could be, yeah, this would be like a good short answer question. You know, why are we taking these samples with replacements? And then you give me a few sentences description. Don't just simply put, well, you wrote during the review, I ID, so there's my answer. <laughs> Tell me why I put that there. Um, Now, for simple statistics, remember we can actually do derivations, or we can actually come up with, I should say, expected value, really written back, expected value star T star. For some simple statistics, we can actually come up with the var star T star. We looked at examples in the project, we looked at an example in the notes involving Y bar. Make sure you understand those derivations. Now, otherwise, though, typically, we are not going to be able to actually do those derivations. So we're going to actually physically need to take the resamples themselves, which essentially is, in case I haven't said this before, basically a Monte Carlo simulation. That's all it is. So once we got done with the, uh, the basic introduction to the different ways to do the resampling, parametric or non-parametric version. Then we started talking about confidence intervals. And we focus on just two for now. Chapter 5 we'll talk about more. We talked about the basic student, the basic interval and the studentized interval. Make sure with both you understand derivations, how they these formulas actually came about. Then in a, like, a, a parametric setting, you know, make sure you understand how you can actually calculate it. Now, oftentimes, again, you don't need to actually take the resamples. And for certain parts of the formulas that we have for these intervals, you can actually say, well, go get a quantile from this particular distribution. Of course, with a non-parametric setting, you know, typically, again, we're going to take the resamples, uh, make sure you understand how to form then the interval. You know, a, a, a particular situation that, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not as big of a deal now that I usually I try, to, try to focus on this in class. Uh, a t typical situation, let's say, in the past is that students don't understand when they're doing the studentized interval, that this V star that's in the denominator there needs to actually be recalculated for every single resample. It is not the same as V itself. You have to actually recalculate for every single resample. Now the easiest way to form these intervals, if you're actually taking resamples, is to use the boot.ci function. So make sure you're familiar with how to do that. Um, 
And remember, you know, in a test situation like this, you know, you want to usually use the easiest way to do stuff because you are under time constraints. So boot.ci is the easiest way to find these intervals. Use it. I think most people in project number one did not use boot.ci. Uh, they did the long way. Well, when's the long way necessary, let's say, on, that, on, a, on an exam situation? Well, maybe I actually ask you to tell me, well, what is, for example, what are the components of, let's say this is the lower bound of a studentized interval. Actually tell me what each of these components are. In that kind of a setting, yes, you know, you would need to, you know, actually do some stuff outside of boot.ci, but you could still use boot.ci and use that as a check to make sure that you did get the right answer. Of course, provided you use boot.ci correctly. Okay. So then we got into the second section of, of chapter two, uh, notes. And we start talking about um, stuff like, well, how large should R be? As in the number of resamples. I wonder if the you know people who wrote let me restate that. Um, Obviously, we have the R software package, and this book uses R resamples. I wonder if anybody ever thought that that would be perhaps confusing when I say the word R. I mean, obviously, the book was written in 97. In the first paper, first, like, a big announcement of that this thing called R was out there uh, came about that time in the Journal of... Um, I can't remember what it stands for. Journal of Computational Graphical Statistics, maybe. It's published by the ASA. And um, it was like 1997. And I was actually subscribing to the journal. I didn't pay attention to the article. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, so how large R should R be? Now, it all comes down to uh, knowing, well, what are you after? So let's say that this is the, uh, the distribution for our statistic T. Okay. Well, if you are trying to estimate stuff that's way out here on the tail, such as a quantile, well, you're going to probably need a larger bar. Because, you know, when you take a sample from this distribution, you know, you're not going to get a whole lot of observations, comparatively speaking, out on the tail than you would in the middle. So you're going to need a larger R. If, however, the thing that you're interested in estimating, let's say, is somewhere, let's say, located in the middle of the distribution, like let's say a mean, well then you're not going to need as large of an R problem. Because you you have a lot of information already with a with a decent sample size. It all comes down to the thing of, well, let's say that you want to, let's say, estimate um, the, let's say the 0.9 quantile, and you take, let's say, 10, uh, 10 resamples. How good of an estimate do you think you're going to get? Uh, then we start talking about pivotal quantities. You know, why are pivotal good? Well, it all comes down to, um, first of all, you know, you learn about pivotal quantities like in 883, so you should have a basic understanding of what it is. Um, but it all comes down to that the, the distribution of a pivotal quantity is not dependent upon any unknown parameters. So if it's not dependent upon any unknown parameters, think of it from a parametric bootstrap setting then. You are not going to have to estimate something. You're not going to have to estimate like a parameter. You would think then that your distribution for T star is going to do a good job of estimating the distribution of T. And in fact, we saw a case where the distributions are exactly the same. Um, but, you know, in a, in a, in a non-parametric setting, unfortunately, it's, it's harder to say, well, well, what's pivotal and stuff? And so we talked about studentized quantities. And, and basically what this is, is just kind of mirroring, uh, mirroring, well, emulating stuff from what you do maybe in other settings in the hopes that this T 
quantity that we have here is maybe not going to be as, let's say, acceptable to changes in parameter values. And um, one of the things that we talked about, too, is that sometimes this, this variance here can be dependent upon theta itself. Well, how can we get around that? Well, there are little things that you can do that involve transformations. We talked about a variance stabilizing transformation. Let's say I have some function h, h of t. Maybe now the variance of h of t is not dependent upon any parameters at all. This would be, play a more important role once we get into chapter 3, but this is where it was first introduced to give you an idea of, yeah, this, this might be important to do. Important to know. So I won't ask you to derive uh, like a very stabilizing transformation like what we did for one example in the class, but I can ask you questions about why, why this might be of interest to have one. Then we also get, got into some other stuff at this particular stage where, you know, unfortunately I couldn't go into all the, or expect you to know all the details behind it, so we didn't necessarily go into all the the, the details about it, but you know you need to understand some of the basics of it so you know what the bootstrap's doing. Uh, you know, perhaps if you get into a research topic for your dissertation that involves the bootstrap, then this is a setting where maybe you do want to get into the actual asymptotics about why the bootstrap works. And so, basically, the asymptotics that we talked about was just uh, it gives us a way to determine well, or it gives us a way to say. How do I know if the bootstrap works or not? And you know, a basic thing that we would like in statistics is that as n goes to infinity, things are going to get to where we want them to be. And so then we, we talked about, well, what does it mean then for the bootstrap to work in this kind of setting? Again, don't worry about derivations. Just understand the basics of what we talked about in terms of, well, we need, for example, f hat to be a good estimate of f. And if that happens and some other stuff happens, things hopefully will work out. We also talked about issues regarding, um, do I want to use that word? Uh, I guess you could say accuracy in terms of, you know, if I use a pivotal statistic, stuff that I do with the bootstrap, generally speaking, um, uh, it, it will work out better in terms of the asymptotic accuracy. If you remember that remainder term when we use that big O notation, uh, it will work out better than if I didn't use a statistic. We also talked about something called an Edgeworth expansion. I'm not going to ask you to do, derive an Edgeworth expansion, just to understand basically that these Edgeworth expansions are, would allow you to examine the asymptotics involving the bootstrap. It allows you to get an approximation for a statistic, of the distribution of the statistic. Then the, uh, the big topic of the, the, uh, the chapter 2 notes, part 2, was this non-parametric delta method. This is often one of the more, more difficult topics for students. And uh, basically what we do is we use a Taylor, -like, Taylor series-like expansion, similar to what you would with a regular old delta method, in order to come up with a way to approximate our statistics. It's a linear approximation, meaning basically we're using a first order result, or the first derivative. And through that then, we are able to come up with an estimate, or we can do some derivations, and come up with this estimate of a variance that has no parametric background to it at all. So that's you know, real, really nice. And in the process of coming up with this variance estimator, we have to do, find something called an influence function. Make sure you're familiar with how to find an influence function. Then with this influence function, once we start talking about the actual sample itself, we have the empirical influence uh, function. And then we have empirical influence values. Make sure you know the difference between the two. Uh, the function, basically you write it in terms of y, the values are repeated in terms of y chain.
then these empirical influence values then allow you to get this variance estimate, which we call VL, 1 over n squared times the sum j equal 1 to n of lj squared. And there's a non-parametric delta method estimate of the variance. Well, having to do these derivations all the time, we're even using the, the EMP INF function to let, let it derive it for you. It's not always as convenient as we would like. Um, especially for more complicated statistics. And so what we did was we learned about two different ways to estimate LJ. One way was with the jackknife. And the jackknife provides a way to then eventually come up with this variance. And this is a very common way uh, that people use for variance estimation. Um, you know, without even thinking about, oh, this is comes about through the empirical influence values and stuff like that. It's a very common way, especially in survey sampling. And then number two, we use this regression-based method, which was an interesting thing that basically used this idea of this, um, this linear approximation for our statistic T and allows us, allows us to use regression to estimate then these LJs. We call the estimates L hats. And you know the main one, main reasons why we, we go through this process of talking about these different ways to estimate the variances because we are interested in this. We want to calculate the student size quantity at times, um, and in particular, for every resample, we want to calculate the student size quantity. And these three methods to get a variance allow, allow us a way to get that denominator part. Now also when you're working with the non-parametric Delphi method, you're often left with situations where um, you have maybe the influence function for uh, parts of this, this, let's say, overall parameter that you're interested in. So if we define, let's say, theta to be a coefficient of variation, so that's a sigma, not a six, sigma over mu, and we could define this then as T1 of F, T2 of F, then, you know, often with these derivations, it's easier to come up with, let's say, an influence function for sigma, influence function for mu, and then we looked at this nice little formula that allowed us to come up with then the influence function for theta itself. Please be familiar with how to use that formula, how you work with those, you have to use some deriv partial derivatives and stuff. Please be familiar with how to do that. It's a very, very useful tool. In fact, there was a, um, an example in the book involving the correlation coefficient. And the first draft of, my, of, of the test, I actually had that example on there. Just to let you know. It's not going to be on the test, but maybe something like it might be on the test. Okay? Okay, so that's all I have specifically to say about the exam. Um, one nice thing about me actually recording uh, what we're talking about right now is that if maybe you missed something that we were talking about, or maybe you just like to just as a review, listen to the recording again, you can. So I think this is one of the nice advantages of, of, of recording stuff like this. Okay, so that's all I have specifically to say about the exam. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Are there, how would you interpret in empirical influence value? Well, I mean, that now gets into the the, the interpretation that I was talking about how the influence function stuff is often used, and that is with respect to um, robustness. How robust is the statistic to a particular value of y? So that's how you would interpret it in that context. So um, the larger the value, I'm sorry, 
let's say the larger an absolute value, the, the value, let's say the more susceptible it might be. Um, yeah, I mean, you can think of it this way. You know, here's the influence function for um, uh, the, 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 the sample uh, for, for the population mean. You know, it's just like this. So here is mu itself. And so you can see that, you know, I know you're talking about empirical influence values, you're talking about a particular yj, but you can just think of it as any possible value of y. You can see that as you're moving out this way, think of it in terms of a yj instead of y, that influence function is going to increase. And now think of it in terms of instead of the influence values, there you go. I won't ask you a question about interpreting the influence value on test. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're only doing that part so that we can get to this variance estimate. It is an interesting area of statistics, though, robust statistics. It probably really got, um, really was, a, let's say, a hot research topic more in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, there's still people doing research on it. Um, and you know, I, do, I do see some of this stuff used sometimes in papers. <coughs> Other questions? You're all just anxious to go watch the backyard farmer live. That's why you don't want to ask questions. Um, driving influence function. And um, the length of the time that took them to complete the exam because they weren't familiar with where to find the correct code to do something. The first time I taught this course in 2006, uh, it was completely open book. Everything was open note. I, the exam, the first student finished, I would say, in an hour and a half. The last student finished somewhere between three and four hours. I think they just like to stick around hard and ball for a while. <laughs> Maybe they were expecting me to buy them dinner and stuck, stuck around long enough. But yeah, it, it took a while. And they did the same thing with the final. And I think part of the reason is because it was completely open book, open note, and sometimes, fortunately, it leads you to maybe not study as much as you should. Um, so, uh, since then I haven't made it open book, open note. Um, and I think since I've been able to finish it a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Will you be checking the list there this weekend? Yep, yep. yep. Just uh, on, on Saturday afternoon or morning, one or two, um, might, I might not be able to respond to me. And please don't post anything during the Wisconsin meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I used or at least to. Just anticipate not getting a reply until ten o'clock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, when I was in grad school in the mid '90s and in late '90s, of course, 